okay, all of the women, get in this cab. You know, I thought maybe they would obey, but it mm, didn't work. I thought maybe it would sound authoritarian, but it didn't work. So they all got in the cab oh, initially, but the cab driver jumped out because there were white girls in the cab, okay? They jumped out, shaking like a leaf. This guy, shaking like a leaf. I said, get back in the cab and get them out of here. We gotta have somebody be able to live to tell what happened. Because they coming at us next, you know, we don't have time for this, you know, get in the cab. He wouldn't obey either. He was shaking like a leaf. There was a mob. He saw the mob. But what frightened him even more than the mob is that some white folks would catch him in the cab with white women. That was even more uh, life-threatening than just facing a mob. He thought that would be sure death, guaranteed. So I couldn't get him to do anything. So I said, all right, well then, uh, you know, in those days, Negro women, get in the cab. So I remember uh, that Catherine uh, Burke, her name was Brooks when she got married, Catherine Burke, she put her hands on her hip. She said, do you think we're going to get in this cab and leave y'all here with the white girls and y'all? They said, no, we're not going to do that. I said, look, we don't have time for discussion. This is an emergency situation, life and death. Get back in the cab. Nope. So I went to my next strategy. I said, all right, well, let's all join hands, pray, and sing we shall overcome. Because we don't know what's going to happen next. Sure enough, that mob waded into us and started beating us up and knocking us down. And Jim Swerd got beaten pretty bad. William Barbee, who was a, a, a young black student from American Baptist College, his name was William Barbee. Um, they threw him down on the ground and forced a lead pipe down his ear. He never did recover. He, we don't know if it was an accident or what, but he was hit by a truck. He walked out in a car, walked out in the middle of the street later on. So he's deceased now. But we remember, because uh, I got kicked in the ribs, in the chest, because I bent over to keep them from kicking me uh, in another part of my body, and I went through the oh, entire rest of the freedom ride with three cracked ribs, because there's nothing you can do with cracked ribs. You can't get any surgery or whatever, you know, you can't put any medication on ribs, okay, on the inside. So, anyway, that was one of the uh, memorable uh, situations that occurred on the freedom rides, and it was pretty tough. And... Um, I, when we got in jail, eventually, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, I remember we made up a song. And we, so what happened is that we were there waiting in jail for the other students to finish the exams and to come on and join us. And um, they just, um, you know, I guess took their time because, but we had to keep up our confidence. That's one thing in nonviolence. You never give up. If you don't give up, it means that uh, you have a chance to succeed. But you must not give up. To give up is to fail. So I started singing a song. And the song goes like this. We're on the third floor of the city jail in Jackson. And they didn't beat us up like they did at Montgomery. We know that they had an arrangement that uh, they came through Mississippi, and they weren't gonna, but they were going to put us in jail, but no physical beating. They had that arrangement with the federal government that we would, you know. That's why we changed our strategy and filled the jail so that everybody would know where we were and they could come and join us, okay? 
So that's why we never did continue the Freedom Ride to New Orleans, because we made that our beachhead. See, the, uh, the strategy in nonviolence has a military base to it. We just don't use the force of violence. We use the force of love, okay, unconditional love. And we also use uh, the whole strategy of doing um, a psychological warfare. Psychological warfare means that you understand the mindset of your opponent and you begin to uh, operate with that knowledge as well because what you're trying to do is do something unusual that would strike the conscience of your opponent. So I developed this theory when I was doing my dissertation at Harvard and it's unusual but genuine behavior has the potential to arrest the conscience of your opponent. If you do something unusual, okay, it has a potential because, see, people behave based on expectations. Like folks want to get you to fight, they know how to provoke you, to say things to you. If that doesn't work, you know, they'll come up and spit on you, slap you. But they expect you to react and re try to retaliate. Then that gives them the uh, justification to defend themselves. And uh, to defend themselves means to the, make you permanently injured so you won't be able to harm them. Okay? So doing something unusual and unexpected throws them off. So... Therefore, uh, when we were in jail, uh, we start singing, okay? And the song goes like this. Buses are a-coming, oh yes. Buses are a-coming, oh yes. Buses are a-coming, buses are a-coming. Buses are a coming, oh yeah. He said to the jailers, Better get you ready, oh yes. Better get you ready, oh yes. Better get you ready, better get you ready, better get you ready, oh yes. They're coming into Jackson. Oh yes, they're coming into Jackson. Oh yes, they're coming into Jackson. Coming into Jackson. Coming into Jackson. Oh yes. So we started singing, you know. Uh, the jailers came in and said, "Stop that singing in here. This is not any playground and a playhouse. This is the jailhouse." You come in here with all that, you know. And we said, uh, loaded with those freedom riders, oh yes. Loaded with those freedom riders, oh yes. Loaded with those freedom riders, loaded with those freedom riders, loaded with those freedom riders, oh yes. He said, all right, that done it. Y'all want to play this game, y'all boogers? He said, uh, if I hear one more peek at you, I'm going to take those mattress. And see, there was an overcrowded situation, so what they did was have mattress on the floor. And sometimes they had single mattress, you know, for like, you know, bunk beds and stuff. Uh, they had more mattress than they had beds. So we had to sleep on the floor. And sometimes two people had to sleep on one mattress. Yeah. And we did what they call end for end. Uh, one person's head down here and another person's feet, and then, you know, there's a magic uh, invisible line down the middle so you didn't move, okay? <laughs> you slept on this mattress, yeah, <laughs> didn't move. No turn it over, okay? So we said, uh, you can take our mattress, oh, yes. You can take our mattress, oh, yes. You can take our mattress, you can take our mattress, you can take our mattress, oh yes. So they brought the other, you know, prison guards in and they start. we started passing the mattress out the door. 
out, you know, just piling them up and everything, you know. And then we say, we will keep our freedom, oh yes. We will keep our freedom, oh yes. And we were just singing and passing out mattress. And we came to continue to sing. And so they said, all right, we can play this game. So he said, um, give me those toothbrushes. Because all of us had our toothbrushes, and you know you're going to jail. That's one thing, you know, in that day you didn't, couldn't, you know, get. So, you know, might get some soap and water, but no toothbrushes. So we all carry our toothbrushes when we expect to go to jail. So um, when he said he was going to take our toothbrush, one of the students said, you can take our toothbrush. Oh, yes. And he said, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> and to give up these toothbrushes there, <laughs> overcrowded situation. And we all in the, each other's face, you know, talking and singing. He said, we got to figure this out. we got to have a Quaker consensus. So we ain't going to have no vote. We're going to have to talk this thing out till we all agree. So we finally decided that we had to find a way to sing without breathing on each other. So I came up with the idea, and what you do is lick your lips. And then you put the, the, the center part of your lips together like that, OK? And leave the sides open. You can take out two sides. Oh, yes. You can take a toothbrush. Oh, yes. You can take a toothbrush. You can take a toothbrush. You can take a toothbrush. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, there's an alternative to everything. It's how you choose to respond. We are not going to stop singing. But we had to take in consideration we had to sing without breathing on each other. So that was a song we made up in jail, at least one of them. Did they finally give in? Yes. What happened was uh, Robert Kennedy decided that doing some research, he found uh, a section in the ICC ruling, Interstate Commerce Commission, and this commission was set up to make sure that uh, goods that were sold from one state to another, interstate commerce, uh, there was no, uh, they, had, they wouldn't tolerate any kind of inequities. In other words, you couldn't sell tires uh, from, uh, say, Ohio to Pennsylvania for one price and then sell the same tires to New Jersey you know, for the, uh, you know, a different price. So there had to be equity in interstate commerce. So they looked at the buses as they were represented interstate commerce because people from different states were paying money and the bus company was interstate. And they even looked at the composition of the bus itself. You know, the lights came from one state and the tires came from another state and the paint on the bus came from another state. So it's a, a replica of interstate commerce. So they decided that this was a case of interstate commerce, and therefore the passengers from different states, okay, as they went through the states, uh, they couldn't discriminate against them. The irony of the thing today, it is still legal to desegregate people who are going from one city to another within the same state in state the books are still there, okay? The law is on the books. So it's, it's legal to segregate people? Yes, if they're going from one city to another within the same state, like from Atlanta to Columbus or Savannah. Wow. That law has not been, it's just difficult to manage because why would you put some people in the back, some blacks in the back, and some in the front, and then say that, uh, you know, it, did, it wouldn't make sense. Because the whole idea was to segregate folk, period. So if you are gonna can't segregate them interstate travel, 
then it doesn't make sense to try to enforce that other law. But that law was never taken off the No. Say that sentence for me. Did you never hear my law? The uh, law still provides that if you're traveling from one city to another within the same state, where they have these segregation laws, that you uh, must be segregated. The law says that, but it's not enforced. It's only interstate travel, okay, that is no longer legal. It's still legal to segregate you if you're going from one city to another. That's intrastate travel. So it's only interstate travel that's been uh, integrated. I'm going to have to cut it off, um, not because we don't have other questions to ask, but because we all have other places to go. I do, too. <laughs> yeah. So, I've got to hit the road. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah you've got to drive to Alabama. So um, I've got more than what I need, obviously. Okay, this good. Is, this, is, this is just really, really great. Good. What I have to do.